Well, this one says 28, that one says 30. Am I live? Yep. Well, good morning then. Welcome to the study of, word, of the Word of God with Spring Valley Bible Church. My name is Phil McMillan, and uh, we're going to continue our study in Timothy here in just a moment. Uh, first thing we need to do is prepare for, the wor for worship with prayer. Nothing we can say or do is, without, is worthwhile to God unless it's done in His power. So search your souls, lay aside your guilt, self-obsession, and problems, and ask Him, God the Father, for the eyes and ears of the Spirit, so that all we say and do this, this morning may edify this local body and glorify our Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to come before your throne of grace and ask for your Spirit's uh, uh, eyes and ears that as we look to your word we may see what you have for us there not uh, not uh, our own desires or our own interpretation but exactly what your spirit wanted to communicate with this with this beautiful passage that uh, you've put in this in the word of God from Paul to Timothy and we pray heavenly father that as Timothy was exhorted and and uh, encouraged by these words that we may be also, that we might learn to uh, live according to your rules, to uh, glorify your son through your power. For it's in his name that we pray, sir. Amen. All right, we seem to be going. Okay. We have, um, first of all, let me uh, start with my, my verse to you from 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the mystery of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And, I, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith may not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. This morning, we're continuing our study of 2 Timothy. We completed chapter 3 last week. Uh, we saw the exhortation by Paul to Timothy in verses 16 and 17 of 2 Timothy 3. And we're picking up our study in chapter 4. But remember, there are... Uh, no chapter breaks in the original epistle. Um, uh, as far as the outline goes, we're still in the section that began in chapter 2. Paul is talking about relationships. In all these relationships, he keeps on urging Timothy to remain committed to Christ and to teaching his word in truth. This is so true for each of us today, believers. We live in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, for sure. Uh, there's legislation on the floor in our Congress right now which will make it illegal to teach the truth in the Word of God. Under the guise of equality, they call it the Equality Act, uh, they say it should be illegal for us to uh, believe that the Bibles, believe the Bible when it says that there are only two genders. Uh, it literally says that. And uh, uh, is going to be used under that guise of equality for uh, diverse sexual preferences. Uh, they're going to say that we can't teach the Bible uh, the way that we we see the Bible written. Okay, and uh, uh, it's of course that's just an interim step to saying you can't teach the Bible. But they'll probably uh, use it to jail a few people before they do the outright ban on the Bible. So as we go through these exhortations today and listen to, to Paul talking to Timothy, please hear these exhortations and know that they are for you. This is the, the time in which we live uh, exactly uh, as it was in, in Paul's day in the church in Ephesus. We're in just as much, we are just as much under the gun as, as they were then. So uh, we're going to pick it up in uh, chapter 4. We did talk about a couple of these things in closing last week. We're going to review them today. Uh, uh, hopefully, we're going to get through uh, verse 5, through the end of verse 5. So let's read through that and get the idea of what Paul continues on in his uh, in his exhortation. We saw 16 and 17 last week. All Scripture is inspired, but God breathed and is profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God might be adequate or uh, equipped for every good work. 
And we're going to see a lot of those same words that you just heard in that passage as we continue on with this exhortation to, to Timothy. So, uh, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not, in, uh, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will assemble for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. Um, and will turn their ears away from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. Remember, this is for you as much as it was for Timothy in the church in Ephesus. Fulfill your ministry and uh, uh, do the work of an evangelist. So, uh, picking up in verse 1, solemnly, I solemnly charge. Uh, my translation has a U in italics there, as many of yours might also. There's no U there. Uh, it's a first-person singular passive uh, uh uh, present passive uh, verb, and uh, this verb, dia martyr romai, uh, is dia, which is an intensive uh, 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 preposition, and uh, used in, when it's used as a, a first part of a compound noun, a verb like this, and thoroughly is, is how it's often translated. And uh, martyr romai, we've seen that word many times throughout the studies, of, both studies of, of Timothy, that um, uh, it means witness, right? And it's got that root word martyr. The English word martyr is in the middle of that. And that's what a martyr is, a witness or uh, 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 testimony of, of God's power and faithfulness, even in the face of persecutions. Persecution even to the point of death, just as our as our Lord suffered. So, um, uh, so we have thoroughly witness or thoroughly testify properly. It means to thoroughly bear witness. Uh, remember, I said it's first person singular, so I'm thoroughly bearing witness. Participle puts an ing on there, uh, or to give solemn, earnest testimony. It's the intensifying prefix dia plus our verb dia martyromai as a, 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 a meaning to, I'm giving clear, full testimony. Okay. Um, uh, the emphasis is not to, 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 to Timothy. The emphasis is on Paul's steadfast resolve in presenting these things. Okay. So uh, I, uh, there's no charge you in this part. You get that idea of charge you, though, from uh, uh, when he carries on with preach the word, uh, be ready in season. Those are uh, verbs addressed directly to, uh, to Timothy. So uh, they kind of took the, the idea from context and, and plugged it into this verb when really the verb is pointing to and, and, and about Paul and his sincerity in making this pledge. I saw, uh, I, uh, I uh, thoroughly bear witness uh, in the presence of God. In the presence there is a uh, Greek word, enopion, and it literally means in the eye of God. Uh, some of your translations might say uh, uh, in the sight of God, or uh, as well as in the presence of God. And it's used for how all things happen under God's watch, right? You, we hear that phrase, we use that phrase in relation to people that happened under his watch, you know. He should have been overlooking that and, and preventing that. Uh, but uh, in the case of God, God sees all, knows all, it's his plan. It's in keeping with his plan built on his absolute knowledge, okay? And and that's the, the idea here that Paul is, is giving this testimony in knowing his relationship with God, knowing that God is in charge. And, and when those persecutions come that he talks about, when, the, when people go astray, God knows that's happening. He, nobody's sneaking by God in any manner.
okay? Uh, so in keeping with this plan in, in his absolute knowledge. So uh, we can keep uh, that, that in the presence of God or in the sight of God, just have that understanding that uh, it's Paul's recognition of God's eternal plan. Uh, and uh, Christ Jesus, um, uh, again, when we put Christ Jesus instead of Jesus Christ, it's, it's an intentional emphasis on the deity of Christ, okay? Uh, that he is the Messiah chosen from eternity past to fulfill that plan of God we were just talking about there, okay? Uh, of God and of Christ Jesus, who is uh, Melo is the Greek verb here, and, or, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 properly at the very point of acting. He's ready, okay, is, is the way this is, comes about. Now, they tried to keep that uh, idea of about to happen with the translation and of Christ, who is to judge, okay, who is to. But, but I think when you translate it just to who is to, you lose the, the imminence of, of this phrase, okay? He's about to do it. He's ready to do it. And now remember, Paul, Paul wrote this some 2,000 years ago, and, and, and to him, it was just as imminent and, and real that Christ is coming and uh, God's plan is going to be fulfilled. And, and it should be that real and that imminent to us in our daily thinking. We should understand that uh, even if Christ does not return, we are to live our lives as if Christ were coming back tomorrow. And we want to help as many people join that, that great celebration as possible. We want to glorify Christ to, to the maximum amount in every moment we're allotted on this earth. And that, that Christ may be glorified through all, in, for all eternity through us. So, uh, uh, at this very point right now, acting, he's ready. It's about to happen. Okay. Melio, according to Thayer, is used in general of what is sure to happen. What is sure to happen. And, uh, uh, uh the one who is about to do something. Okay. And the thing that he's about to do here is to judge the living and the dead. We have people saying that they know what's right and wrong, and uh, we don't. We can't t tell what's right and wrong from reading the Word of God. They are the ultimate uh, arbiters of, of what's right and wrong. Well, there is an ultimate judge who has set what is right and wrong. And all of us are going to answer to that righteous judge uh, one day, hopefully soon. Uh, built on his, uh, uh, in general, the one who is about to judge, judge is Crino, um, uh, judge the living and the dead. Uh, and here's, here's the other things. It's, it's hard to catch here that, We've talked about uh, in the presence of God the Father and of the Son in a description of the Son there, who's going to be that judge, right? Now we have two more things that that uh, 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 Paul is swearing by, okay? And uh, uh, these are actions of Christ that are coming up. Um, who is the judge of the living dead and the dead. And by his appearing, that's where uh, uh, the Greek word epiphania, and that's where we get the English epiphany, right? And that's a, a, an appearance, or when we, when we get a glimpse of, of God or an angel or uh, Christ coming to the earth, or to earth, these are all called epiphanies. And we use it in a modern sense to mean we, we saw a fact or you know, we realize it. We almost have that heuristic idea behind it when we say, oh, I had an epiphany, right? And, uh, uh, but in this case, it's the appearing of, of, of Christ when he returns that we've just mentioned in our context. Uh, he's going to judge the living of the dead. And I'm giving also giving this testimony uh, by his uh, uh, appearing, appearing. It's going to be the proof that my testimony, my witness is true. I'm swearing by these things because when they happen, it proves that I was standing, I was giving a, a true testimony, right? Um, I remember uh, uh, one year, you know, way by way back in the beginning of the NFL, the Detroit Lions were a great team, 
and uh, uh, they won some Super Bowls and everything. And uh, uh, for whatever reason, they their their franchise declined, and they haven't put together a a, a, a championship in some twenty years, you know. And uh, the the last time that they had a really good run, you know, they had, they won like their first six six or seven games. And everybody was really excited for him, but there was one group of guys. It was it was uh, six or seven old guys, and they had gone to they had season tickets every year, every year through that long long slump. Right? They had been they had been up there rooting for the Detroit Lions, and uh, unfortunately they didn't go much further that season. But there was a, a story they were interviewing these guys, and these guys were talking about. We've always believed in this franchise. We've always known they could do it. You know, and and if they had, if that team had won the Super Bowl that year, they would have felt like they were the kings of the world for having, for having stuck with them and rooted for them all through that time, right? And uh, uh, it would have, it would have been to their glory that this this magnificent thing they've been waiting for had happened. And that's exactly how we're going to feel when Christ returns. Uh, what, what, and, uh, notice that it says the living or the dead, and the dead, right? It doesn't matter if we, uh, have long since been gone or if we are still here on the earth at the po point of his return. It's going to be glorious and a glorious appearing and it's going to be the, the, uh, crowning of, of our, our witness, of our belief that it was all true and, uh, uh, you should have believed it when I told you about it, guys. <laughs> Let's see. So, uh, uh, and when he appears, it says, uh, by, it was going to be proved by his appearing and by his, his kingdom. Because after Christ comes and gets us, and then he comes back to the earth and appears in the end of the tribulation, that's when he establishes, establishes his kingdom. Not only will our salvation be secured, the, the promises made to Israel will be secured, and Christ will sit on a throne uh, that rules the entire earth for a million years. Now that's a one world government we can all get behind. Now, but, uh, the fact of the matter is, even though Christ will be the ruler of the world at that time, there are still nations, right? It's, uh, uh, not just, uh, in, in, uh, uh, word, but, uh, they're gonna really be nations that, uh, uh, come before the world government of Christ, just as we as individuals form a nation and our, and we as individuals come before God. Uh, it's it's one one ruler of the world, but many nations, just like there are many individuals. Okay, so uh, publish. Uh, let's see. So uh, he's going. He's swearing by these things because when these things happen, his witness will be confirmed to be true. So uh, uh, I I bear thorough witness. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. And this is, now here comes the, the part that's to Timothy, okay? You, I give testament. You do these things. And these are um, um, uh, not, not imperatives, right? I love the word study, or the study that Herman did a number of years ago talking about the imperative tense and, and the sub, and subjunctive and comparing how those things come down in Greek. And, and he, he made the excellent point that an imperative is the farthest thing removed from reality. Even though we think of it, we generally think of a command as, uh, I'm going to tell you, and it's going to happen. God tells us this, and we're going to do that. You know, we're going to make that happen because God told us to do that. The fact of the matter is when God gives a command, it's thrown out there with your volition behind it. And you may do it or may not do it, but it's to your advantage to do it because God doesn't give you a command that you cannot follow or that is not going to benefit you, right? And, uh, <laughs> but these aren't mandates. These are not mandates. These are not commands. These are present tense verbs. Preach the word. Content it's, it's, it's indicative reality. Do this. Okay. And, uh, not as a command, but let, uh, 
keep preaching the word, I guess, because uh, uh, the Greek lacks that uh, uh, direct equivalent to the way we use the present continuous tense, right? So a lot of times we'll look at a, a present tense verb in Greek and we have to, t to translate it as a present continuous in English to get the, the contextual uh, reality of that word. So uh, keep on preaching and uh, preaching the word is the first result that Paul wants to see in Timothy because of this witness that he has put forth. He says, uh, preach the word, and that word preach is uh, keruso, and it means to, uh, to publish, to proclaim openly uh, something which has been done. Something which has been done. This word proclaim is used... Uh, uh, in, in describing, uh, John, the, the voice in the wilderness, he proclaimed that, that, that Christ had come. And, uh, uh, often we see this word in association with, with the, uh, the millennial kingdom or the, the proclaim the kingdom of God. Uh, it's, it's closely tied often to, uh, the kingdom of, of God as much as, uh, uh, anything else. And and here, though, it's pretty much tied to the gospel, right? To proclaim something which has been done. Well, what was done? Christ died to save us from our sins, right? And uh, that's the thing that we're to keep on proclaiming each and every day. Proclaim, preach the word, and be ready. This is uh, epi, epi a feast a feast day. Um, it's it's epi the prefix again. That's an intensifying prefix, right? And uh, histami histami means to stand, stand firm, stand in your place. And epi histami is uh, uh, to uh, uh, stand in readiness. Okay, to stand by in readiness. Be ready. And uh, uh, the thing that he is to be ready to do all the time, standing by, waiting for it to happen, it is, uh, uh, again, preach. Preach the word, be ready, uh, standing by, in season and out of season. This is uh, 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 two adverbs, and uh, we've talked about uh, uh, the prefixes, Eu, E-U, is a prefix meaning good, and ah, that prefix is often a privative, meaning not, right? And uh, it's the same adverb two times in a row, once with a U and once with an ah. So uh, uh, the adverb is, is uh, uh, a season, right? Uh, a, a proper time to do something. So uh, uh, eukairos akari. Akaros, okay, the same same uh, uh, form with a different prefix in it, following the the uh, verb to be ready, be ready in season, out season, okay. Uh, now we think of a a season, right? Just as you would think, that word is being used just as you would think of uh, uh, spring, winter, summer, fall, right? And uh, the seasons, you got to remember. We, we've lost so much of our agrarian existence in the modern world. People don't have an idea that their food comes from the ground <laughs> these days. And, uh, like, uh, uh, one politician put his, his, his foot in his mouth not long ago and said, farmers were stupid. All they got to do is throw some seeds in the ground every once in a while. And, and that's all there is to the job. And, uh, 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 but it takes a lot of preparation. You have to be ready for that next season. As this season happens, this period of dormancy in winter, we've got to uh, uh, start seedlings in, in a greenhouse. We've got to get a little plant re ready to go in the ground. As soon as the thaw comes, we've got to get out there and prepare the ground. We've got to do a lot of things to get ready so that when the season to grow comes, We'll be ready, right? We can get out there and put our plants in the ground. And uh, uh, 
my wife is going to remind me it's time to start our garden as soon as this class is over now. <laughs> but uh, uh, we, you've got to anticipate the growing season. You've got to anticipate when, you, when you're ready to harvest. If you're a big farmer, you've got to do something with that produce. You've only got a short window of time to, to can it or sell it or do, eat it or do what you're going to do with it because it will go bad. If you aren't prepared, you're going to lose a lot of your crop. And uh, depending on the crop. And uh, 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 and then we've got to get those things stored up and ready so that we have something to eat through the winter time in that dormancy period. And then as it comes around again, we prepare for the next spring. And, and that's the idea of be ready in season, out of season. You've got to be uh, equipped with the gospel. You've got to know the word of God. You've got to keep looking to the word of God so that when that season comes, when you have the opportunity to give the gospel or, or, or teach the word or spread the word in some way, you'll be standing by, ready to do that job, ready for God, the Holy Spirit, to work in, in you, right? You're, you're the, you're the uh, firearm. God, the Holy Spirit, has to have some bullets in you, okay? <laughs> and you get that by studying and, and learning the word of God before the necessity of witnessing to someone comes up, right? So, um, be ready in season and out of season. And then this is, these are the things you're going to be ready to do. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Reprove is a word that uh, we just saw not too long ago. Um, Elanxon. And uh, it's the same word that we saw in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching for reproof, right? Reproof is the same as reprove. And we saw as we looked at that word in the Greek last time that it has the idea of convict people, okay? Or, or, or you have the words where God, the Holy Spirit, can convict people through you, I, I should better say. But uh, to reprove is to, to have that evidence of the word of God in your soul so that you can use it to convict other people. Uh, the next word, rebuke is from uh, epi and tamao. Tamao means to fix the value or to price something. And epi is that intensifying pre uh, uh, prefix again. And, and you put these two together, and it means to honor, to met out, do measure, or to censure. Okay, well, that, that comes right into uh, with what we saw about training in righteousness. Remember that word paideia that we saw in the Greek for training? It had the idea of, of you know, when to, to pat them on the head, you know, when to spank them on the bottom, right? It, it went both ways according to the situation. And that's exactly what we have with this word. It's translated rebuke here, and it can mean to rebuke someone, but it's also got an idea of, of, of righteous judgment behind it. When you see the fruits of the Spirit, you pat them on the head and say, I see the fruits of the Spirit. I, I, I see your patience. I see your, your love. I, I see your uh, generosity towards others. And that's encouraging them but it's still the same exact word. And when you see someone uh, 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 not demonstrating the fruits of the Spirit and it's disrupting the local uh, assembly, you may have to pull them aside and say, hey, you're not representing our church in the, in, in the fruits of the Spirit in the situation, and you're going to have to change that, right? And, uh, and that's a, a, a tough situation to have to be in, to, to, to reprove someone, to rebuke someone in that manner. And to do that, you need the reproof part. You need the words for conviction, right? And you also need the fruits of the spirit. And that's why, uh, we've got some really, a really cool word coming up next. And while we're going to see the fruits of the Spirit mentioned exactly at the end of this, of this phrase. Okay. So, uh, we're going to be ready to, uh, uh, ready to, uh, reprove, rebuke, and 
Exhort is the uh, translation of the next word in, in, in the NA, uh, uh, New American Standard, NAS here. This word is the verb form of paraclete. That should be a familiar word to you. Paraclete is the, is the helper, the uh, advocate, the, the title of God the Holy Spirit that Christ gives when he says, I'm going to send a paraclete to you, right? Well, this is the verb form of it, paracleto. And it means, uh, 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 can mean to call to one side, to call for someone, to summon someone, right? Uh, the long definition here, uh, from the from the lexicon is uh, to address, to speak to, to call upon, which may be done in a way of exhortation or entreaty, comfort inst or instruction. It's to admonish or exhort. It's to beg, to beseech, to strive to appease by entreaty, to console, to encourage and strengthen by consolation, to comfort, to encourage or strengthen. <clears throat> to instruct and to teach. What a magnificent verb. These are all the functions of God, the Holy Spirit, as he, as he works in us as, as our paraclete, right? He's, he's the one doing all of these, all of the things in this verb. He's teaching us. He's comforting us. He's instructing us and, uh, he's encouraging us. When, notice that, that word, the basic de definition is to call to one side, right? To summon them to you. This is, this is again, this importance of relationship in God's whole plan and especially in the local body. Then, um, uh, when we say exhort, that word hortatory, it means that, that in, in gr grammatically, it means that we're going to do a verb together, right? And we, we say that, we express that in English by saying let's. If I say let's go to a movie, you're not going to be sent to the movie with $5 to get out of my hair, right? It means we're going to go to that movie together and we're going to eat popcorn together and we're going to have fellowship together, right? Let's do this together. And that's the idea in this verb. It's the relationship that's important here that you call that person to you and you encourage them, you comfort them and you assure them you're in that journey with them, okay? So we saw that, that uh, negative side of rebuke, right? Well, it isn't done in arrogance telling someone, well, I've got to straighten you out, right? It's done in, in, in this idea of the way God, the Holy Spirit works in us. We're going to call them to our side. We're going to encourage them to be in the, in, in the uh, filling of the Spirit and how that works. We're going to teach them. We're going to comfort them if they've been wronged. And that's what caused their, their uh, outburst. We're going to respond through God, the Holy Spirit, just like God, the Holy Spirit acts towards us. Okay. And in, and in case we'll go on here in this ver in the rest of this verse and say, uh, 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 reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience, um, uh, or with, with all patience. Some translations are saying there with great patience and instruction. Well, Patience, that Greek word for patience there is macrothumia. And that's one of the fruits of the patience that we see when we look at the list of the fruits of the spirit. Uh, macrothumia is long suffering, right? Even though it, 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 it may be the third time I've had to summon that person and, <laughs> and, 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 uh, uh, try to help them get back in harmony in the relate, in the relationships in the church. I've got to keep on doing that as long as God, the Holy Spirit is working and they're responding in any way. How many times do I got to do that? Seven times 70. There's no, there's no, uh, uh, limit on it except for when that person says, I'm right, you're wrong. Sin is right. And, and, and the, the word, and you're not explaining the word of God to me in the correct way. That's when it comes time to say, okay, maybe you need to find another assembly, right? Uh, but uh, uh, as long as they're making that effort and there's, and there's still relationship, they still come when you say, call, when you call them, right? And, and they listen to you, then we keep playing, we keep plugging. Uh, and no matter how 
our patients may be tried in this in the situation. So, uh, um, incident rebuke, uh, exhort uh, with great patience, macrothumia, and instruction is didache. And uh, we've seen, uh, um, and we'll see again, uh, this word uh, uh, didaskalos. We saw it uh, in uh, uh, chapter 3, verse uh, verse 15. Yeah, uh, We saw the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith. That was uh, uh, understanding, learning Bible doctrine. When we have this, uh, this verb for teaching, didaskalos, it's got that discipleship idea behind it. And remember, as disciples, it's not just about what we know, it's about what it does in our lives, right? A disciple is, is and, and there were lots of disciples for lots of different teachers in the Old Testament, okay? Every rabbi had disciples, okay? And, and part of their, their job as a disciple was to demonstrate by their life that what they were learning from that that rabbi was was real, and to the to their benefit and the benefit of others, and to teach others about it. Okay, and uh, so the this idea in the Christian realm is not new. It's some, it's the way things went in the old in the in the ancient world between in that relationship between teachers and students. Okay, and uh, Christ Himself was called rabbi by many, right, teacher. So, um, with great patience, macrothemia, and instruction, didache, teaching them doctrine. Um, verse 3, for the time will come, and now is, ladies and gentlemen, the time will come. And, and that's a, 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 a future reality when we say it will, it's going to happen there. That's a, a straight up future tense. And it's, and it's, a, it's talking about something that's going to happen. And God knows it's going to happen. And Paul knows it's going to happen because Paul certainly seen it, right? Um, uh, but the time, uh, for the time will come when they, those who've fallen a, a, astray, um, those who will be judged by Christ um, will um, not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. Um, so sound, sound doctrine, that's a word uh, we've seen several times in, in, throughout Timothy and uh, something that uh, occurs quite a few times in the in the in the epistles, and this word "sound doctrine" is uh, this is a mouthful. It's uh, "hugiaino," and uh, uh, it, it that "oo" sound in the first of it "who" is uh, the Greek "upsilon." And when we translate, we have an English word from this Greek word, and we transliterate it with that Y, and it sounds like hygiene, okay? <laughs> and, and, uh, when, when we are hygienic, right, we're being, we're being clean for health's sake, to keep sound, our sound of body, right? Healthy body. And, uh, uh, that's the idea behind this word. This is, is doctrine that is, is, good for you, clean and good for you, and does not defile you, right, or lead others astray. And uh, uh, that word doctrine is indeed didaskalia, and uh, it's, you know, again, ladies and gentlemen, you know, the, the word of God is, is replete with this word didaskalia or, and forms of it. God is the ultimate arbiter of what is right and wrong. That's why he's going to judge the living and the dead. And uh, uh, that's why his fun God, the Holy Spirit function in us, helps us to discern what's the right thing and wrong thing to do in any particular relationship instance in the local body. And uh, 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 doctrine is not a bad word. Right? Doctrine simply means this is all the truth God has given us about a particular subject. 
And uh, sometimes that's that can be easy to find, and sometimes it can it can be a little more, more laborious to get the nuance and 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 uh, details behind a particular doctrine or concept in the Word of God. And uh, uh, but you know we're as disciples, the Daskalia is the exact thing that we're supposed to learn. Okay, make no doubt about it. Doctrine is not the the goal of the Christian life. It's the means of the Christian life. It teaches us how to understand when we're in the filling of the Spirit. It teaches us that we need our faith to be in the filling of the Spirit. And uh, uh, so uh, you can't discount learning the Word of God if you want to live a Christian way of life. And uh, but But it's tough sometimes to learn the Word of God. It's tough to hear weird Greek words when you're sleepy on Sunday morning. It's easier to stay in bed and take and after a long week and, and not worry about any other relationships outside of your house and to not, and, and, uh, uh, it's, it's much more fun to finally get up later in the afternoon, go to some place where you can, uh, sing and, uh, and, and have a great, uh, uh, four piece band behind you and, uh, uh, feel good about yourself. Those, those are, you know, that's the easy way, right? And it makes us feel like we're, be, we're doing what we need to for God. But the thing we really need to do for God is to learn his word, even on a, even when it's tough. But wanting to have their ears tickled, right? They don't want the heart, the, the sound doctrine, the hard way to, to have a relationship with God. They will accumulate for themselves reflexive pronoun there, they're doing it for their own benefit. Why are we learning the word of God? Is it for our superiority? No, it's for our benefit so that we know God's what God wants from us in our lives so that we know how to recognize it when we see it. And we know how to get to, to reach that goal through faith. And, uh, um, but, uh, Instead of uh, doing the hard work they want to accumulate for their own benefit, teach for themselves, teachers in accordance with their own desires, right? One of the other cognate words for uh, 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 didascalia, doctrine, is, is discipline, disciples, right? And uh, 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 it's, it's much easier to... Find that, that pastor that's gonna, gonna tell us God loves us and make us feel good about ourselves. It, and feel like we're having a relationship with God than it is to be a, a disciple that looks to the Word of God to learn how to live their, your life. So, because they want to fulfill their own desires. Again, they're saying they're doing it for God, but they have drawn to themselves, for themselves these these ideas uh, and they're doing it to please themselves they want to feel good about themselves not do the hard thing and so they will turn their away their ears from the truth aletheia is found in that uh, uh, sound doctrine that we just saw okay turn away from the truth and will turn aside to myths okay muthos and when and we think of of mythology, right? Myths and the Greek gods and all of that things, and all those things. But uh, it, it it's any story, right? That we want to tell for entertainment to try and teach people about God. So uh, muthos happens a lot more than just the standard stories of Hercules and 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 uh, Zeus and the gang and all the things that went on there. And we tell we love to tell little stories and anecdotes and and uh, read a poem and and make it sound like we're talking about God or the gods and uh, 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 and be entertained by it. But uh, we're not doing it for them. We're doing it for us. Okay, so. Uh, this is what's going to happen when people turn away from sound teaching, sound doctrine. These are the things they're going to seek, things that serve them rather than serve and glorify God. Okay, And uh, uh, in verse 5 here, but you, 
but this is our, our strongest contrast word in Greek day. And uh, it means the, it, the exact opposite thing is coming up. And you are supposed to be that exact opposite thing. Not one that uh, 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 turns away from the truth and, and seeks to entertain yourself and call it worship of God. Not one of those. You're going to do exact opposite. Okay. Uh, you're going to learn, you're going to endure hardships. And he does, you remember, he just talked about persecution in, in verse, in uh, chapter three. He's got a word for persecution. He could use persecution here. He's not talking about persecution. He's talking about just tough times in life, right? And, uh, like getting, getting up at five o'clock in the morning to study for Bible class. <laughs> and, uh, it, it can be a hardship, but we're going to do it if that's what's necessary to fulfill God's plan and to further his word, right? And, uh, so, uh, this, this isn't the, the, the tough stuff that comes at you because you're in God's side. This is just endure hardships, the tough parts of life. Do the study, uh, uh, you know, Often in the Old Testament, in the, in Acts and in the early church, uh, uh, we, and even in the epistles, we see service from, from one to the other. Feeding widows, taking care of children. All these things are work, right? We have a sign up list here. We, you know, it takes somebody to, to vacuum the place every once in a while, even when we don't have a lot of foot traffic through here. We've got to vacuum every once in a while and, and dust never rests, that's for sure. And, uh, uh, you know, we have just plain work, right? That has to be done. And it's not easy, but somebody's got to do it. And fulfilling that service is just as important as, as, as me teaching this Bible class. Or uh, uh, um, Julie and, and Brian keeping us on the internet. <laughs> These are services that that support and 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 keep this local body going, and they aren't always easy jobs. Okay, and uh, uh, but they are indeed what we are called to do for the for the relationship we have with the church. Okay, do the uh, uh, endure the hardships, do the work of an evangelist. Evangelist is, is this Greek word is really cool because it was uh, it, it it's one who is is proclaiming something again proclaiming something that has been done and it's the title that was uh, given to people like Timothy and uh, and uh, others after the apostles. The apostles were the first one to spread the news of Christ and his work of salvation. And the, the people who fulfill that job subsequently, uh, uh, were called evangelists, right? They're spreading that gospel, that good, that good news and fulfill your ministry. And again, fulfill your ministry is make your ministry complete. Okay, and we're going to fulfill our ministry in our lives by using God, the Holy Spirit, to learn His Word, teach His Word, and and to uh, bolster, fulfill, or, or make the relationships that we have with one another in the local church. And we aren't going to have those if we aren't in the local church, right? Uh, so we've got to got to get to church. We've got to study the Word of God together, and we've got to serve our 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 Lord through our church, whether it's within the church or in the outreach of the church. It's all to the glory of God, and sometimes it's tough, but it's always to the glory of God, and that makes it worthwhile. So we uh, uh, wrap up here at the uh, end of this section in our outline where. Paul is talking to Timothy about uh, the relationships that and, and how he deals with others in his local assembly. And uh, uh, I wanted to go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now that we've uh, taken a few weeks and uh, uh, slogged through here verse by verse, and, and uh, uh, I want to read this section again. And try not to preach too much so you hear it one more time in, in its unity, uh, in, in the, the way it's presented here. And I want you listening for 
uh, uh, two things. One is the commitment to Christ. Remember Christ. Remember Jesus Christ, it says. Uh, be committed in, in, in your service. It's going to use that word several times, to be steadfast, to be committed to Christ in your relationship with God. And all the other all the other parts of it that are talking about relationships to each other, you're going to keep hearing words that are fruits of the Spirit, okay? You're going to keep hearing uh, about love and kindness and patience and goodness, and the, and the basis of knowing all of this repeated several times through it is sound doctrine, learning and knowing the word of God. So picking it up in Second Timothy chapter two, you therefore, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And these things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Uh, no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. So, And also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffered hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason, I endured all things for the sake of those who are chosen, that they may also, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. It is a trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. Rem remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to, to, to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handing, ac handling accurately the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and thus they have set the faith of some. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord abstain from wickedness. Now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if a man cleanses himself of these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. And the Lord, Lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snares of the devil, having been held ca captive by him to do his will. Chapter 3, But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, 
irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness, although they have denied, denied its power and avoid such men as these. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. And just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men of depraved mind, rejected as, regard, as regards the face, faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all. If, uh, but as also that of those two, uh, James, Janice, and John Brace, came to be. But you, following my teaching, conduct purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecution, suffering, as such happened to me at, at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What per persecutions I endured. And out of all of them, the Lord delivered me. And indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from, uh, proceed to worse, uh, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things which you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed, profitable and, uh, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, adequate and equipped for every good work. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. And these things Paul gave to Timothy, he gives also to us, ladies and gentlemen, Read that through again and you're, and when you're uh, wondering what you're supposed to be doing in the plan of God. And uh, remember that God's work is done in God's power. As just as you have relied on Christ to save you eternally, rely on his spirit to work his, his fruits in your life and to glorify Christ through them. For that's our objective and the reason we're on this earth. No matter what the world says around us, we know the truth and we'll be free in that truth. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, for the things that you teach us, that encourage us, that comfort us, Heavenly Father, that give us the, the patience to deal with a, a wicked world that's turned their backs on you. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that all those who seek you may find you in your word and that if you may use us to spread that, that you would uh, would do so. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we might uh, remember the things that we've learned about these words of Paul and that we might uh, uh, recall them and that our, our understanding of this exhortation would uh, be deeper and that we would uh, uh, be encouraged to use it in our lives. We ask all these things, Heavenly Father, that our Lord and Savior might be glorified. For it's in his name that we pray, sir. Amen.